Welcome into Unbreakable, a mental wealth podcast with Jay Glazer. I'm Jay Glazer. Got a great guest for you today. You've definitely heard him. Uh, you've seen him play football. He's won Super Bowls. But before I get to him, if you're like many people, you may be surprised to learn that one in five adults in this country experienced mental illness last year, yet far too many failed to receive the support they need. Carolyn Behavioral Health is doing something about it. They understand that behavioral health is a key part of whole health, delivering compassionate care that treats physical, mental, emotional, and social needs in tandem. Carolyn Behavioral Health, raising the quality of life through empathy and action. I welcome into Unbreakable, a mental wealth podcast with Jay Glazer. We've switched it up from mental health to mental wealth. The more we can work on our mental health, the more our mental wealth grows. With that, I want to bring in, uh, how do I introduce the mirror? So, two-time Super Bowl champion, Patriots. He was there for the 28-3 game, obviously, for the Patriots. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, uh, got a great tattoo as a result of that win. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> Second round pick of the St. Louis Rams. Uh, but also, probably best accomplishment, Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Gave up his entire 2017 salary uh, to charity and host of the Greenlight Podcast, the one and only, my nephew, Chris Long. How are you, brother? Uncle Jay. What's the <laughs> word, man? <laughs> People, know, you know, sometimes it's funny. We go back. I, I've known you since you were like nine, I think. Yeah, it had nine to be. or eleven. Yeah, it's had to be that long. And yeah. even then, you were taller than me. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> were we eye to eye? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got quite the history, man. You know, right. uh, and we have one close friend in common. Um, Kyle Long. Big, yeah. Yeah, Kyle Long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that other guy who looks and like the Lurch other guy, and, Frankenstein. Yeah, he looks like Lurch, Frankenstein, and Herman Munster all combined. Uh-huh. Obviously, you know, my brother, Howie Long. Uh, that's why I, Call Chris, my nephew. So here's, I want to dive in a few things, but you know, your podcast wildly successful. And, you know, I work with a lot of these players of, you know, when they're retired, how to handle transition, how to handle retirement, um, which is difficult for a lot of guys They jump out to try to find the next thing. You lose your, your team, you lose your, uh, your structure more than anything, like your schedule for the first time in your life. You, you don't know where to go, when to go, who to go with, who to sit with, who to eat with. How did the, the genesis of the crux of your podcast come about because this was you started when there really wasn't you know a lot of these players are now following your lead but it was like you and pat mcafee and that was really it so how did tell me that i've never asked you this i never dived in to how the genesis of this started yeah i never thought about it like the thing you just said with pat and me and there's a couple other guys i'm sure that have been podcasting a while but you know i like how you guys have blown it up yeah no i mean like we've been lucky and more than anything we've just been consistent you know like there were, I mean, there's still days where I'm like, what the are we doing? No, you know, no, no, like, we, this is my podcast. You know, you're what the first. fuck are we doing here? <laughs> you know, like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, like, um, is this a purpose? You know, is this, am I happy doing this? Does this seem successful? Like, is this success? Is this who I want to be? Do I want to be a podcaster? Like, it's a weird thing to go from like a gladiator to like, mm-hmm a guy with a microphone that's supposed to be intellectual and, and, you know, have these thought provoking conversations and overanalyze stuff and sensationalized stuff. You know, the media is what you make it Jay. Right. Um, you know, I think back in the day it was like, Hey, the media is, I used to talk to coaches about this, like the media, there's us and there's them, you right. know, that whole thing. And I understand that beat writers and you know, the, the history of people that have to get a story out and, you know, 24 hour news cycle, you got, mm-hmm. ESPN, you got to mine for topics every day. So there is this, this kind of thought that like the media is all one thing, but I think what players have done is they've cut out the middleman. And not that I'm saying the middleman's a bad guy. I think the media is extremely important. We don't get paid as much as we get paid. You look at that new, that new salary cap of North of $255 million in the NFL. Like these are huge numbers and TV deals matter. The media matters. So I'm appreciative of all that, but we wanted to do things differently. Like I wanted to do things on my terms and, and be the boss and build something. I, I, long story short, I just, I started thinking about it at the end of my career and what, what at the end of your last year or like two years or three years or so probably my last year. Cause you know, like backing up 2017, I ended up in Philly, got very lucky, was a part of a Super Bowl team. You know, it was my second two years. Very lucky. Just right place, right time. I liken it to like picking a Super Bowl future as a player. You know, we can't gamble, but that was my best 
my best uh, long shot odds bet on the Eagles, like to go there in free agency to leave the Pats. We won a Super Bowl 2018. I wasn't as happy. I was real happy in Philly. I love being an Eagle and all that stuff. But, the, you know, the realities of being a vet in the NFL and like the way that people look at you and, and count you out and your body and all that stuff. I was like, man, I'm about to be done. Like at some point here, I need to be done. And, and I think it's always important. I think how you leave the game is so important to your psyche. Like, were you, were you run out of league? Did you leave on your own terms? How did you leave? Like, there's only a few ways you can leave and most of them aren't good. So Cause that's a forever memory, right? It's like your last memory. Yeah. Instead of it's so hard for us to go back and think like, I, I got to force myself to think about the things I've done in the past instead of yesterday. Yes. No, no, no question. And right. like, whether you, whether you're dwelling on it or not, it dictates the way your thought patterns go and the way you, Every day when I look at football, we all have regrets. We all have things we wish we did. We we all have maybe some, I mean, nobody leaves the game clean. Right. You know, we all, I won two Super Bowls in my career. Couldn't have gone better. And I still have regrets. I still dwell on the past. I'm still hard on myself. And, you know, I think, I think going into that transition, it's like, you're a baby, dude. You're just, you're learning to walk again. Um, it's a totally different reality and it's hard for anybody to anticipate it. Even me who I was like, Oh, I'm going to plan this out. It's important to have a plan for what you want to do before you finish. And I kind of started planning a little bit prelimin preliminarily in 2018. And then when I retired, I was like, okay, I got this plan. I'm going to go and act it. And of course your plans are shit. You realize as you're getting going that you don't know anything. And so you know, I think for me, the media making a decision to have my own podcast was dictated by a couple of things. I was afraid of retirement. I was afraid of idle time. I do not. I'm a grinder. I like to work. I like to have a purpose. Um, I like to build something. I'm creative. So the creative part excited me, but it was mo mostly about like, I'm afraid of what I will, will happen to me if I don't have a job, right. like straight up, yeah. like all the, the horror stories, you know, you hear. And they can hmm. kind of compound and it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're like, well, that's just what's going to happen to me. Like, I'm going to lose my fucking mind. I'm going to have all this idle time. I'm going to get a divorce. I'm going to lose all my money. Like, you know, all the horror stories. I was like, if I can just figure out a purpose, I'll be okay. And so through that purpose, what I've realized over the last couple of years is I didn't know anything. Um, two, I'm a workaholic and I've needed to chill out on that because it's almost like I got out and worked more than I did when yeah. I played, which we got, we got to learn how to exhale. Yeah. yeah. That's a mistake, but it's one that I'm okay with learning on the fly. You know, like I'm, I, I think making mistakes is a really good way to, to learn. And, um, Wait, tell, tell me why it's a mistake. Cause I, cause I want players to hear this. Cause I, I always, again, I, I talk to a lot of guys and I'm like, listen, you, you spilt the blood, you put the sweat out there. Yeah, you need to find something, but you also learn how to, you have to learn to say, I put my body through it so I can exhale, so I can enjoy yeah. the next part of my life. So explain that a little bit more. I think it's a mistake to go right. It's good to have a plan, but in your plan, there needs to be a decompression period. Um, you need to force yourself to face your fear. If you have a plan. If you have a plan and you know that, hey, in six to eight months, I'm going to get to work on this business venture. I have it seated. I'm doing kind of like prelim preliminary work. I've done the homework. I've got this thing outlined out, but I need to sit with my family for a couple months. I need to figure myself out a little bit. Um, I think in retirement, you learn so much about yourself that football has football obscures all your problems. It's like a Band-Aid. You know, it, it can create problems and the stresses and the, you know, like the existential crisis of being a football player and all that stuff and the transition. But more than anything, like you don't work on yourself from you work on your body, you work on your your mind, you work on your 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 football career from the time. If you're like me from 16 to 38, I was one thing. Yep. So there's no room to work on yourself. There's no that thing is obscuring your view. And as great as it is, you got to, you got to rip that bandaid off and uh, you have to be supported socially. You have to have friends. You have to have, you know, if you've got family, you have to have a home base. I was lucky to have all those things. Right. I had a plan, but what I didn't give myself was a fucking break, dude. You know, like, I think I went 
since I retired, I took my first week vacation, maybe like two, a year and a half ago. Um, and that you were was retired. How long? Like four or five years. Right. You know, like I just, I'm not saying this, like I work, dude, that's just what I like to do. I have to be in movement, but there are other ways. Like, I think you have to get good at, 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 you know, this idle time, bro. Right. Because that's what, that's what, um, that's what sinks a lot of guys. If they don't know how to, how to be bored, you know, you've, you got to learn to be bored a little bit because the NFL is like this, right? We're really good at riding the wave and the lows are tremendous and the highs are amazing. Retirement's more like this. It's yeah. flatline. And that is a really scary thing for me. And it's a scary thing for a lot of guys. Like I can handle the roller coaster ride. I right. live for that. Yeah, you live for you know? chaos. The calm. I always said I'm great in chaos. Man, I suck in calm. And that's yeah. when right in the calm is when the roommates in your head just don't get along. And, and you got to be crazy to be on this level and your roommates don't get along. That's the biggest journey I've had is trying to get myself to have the roommates in my head, get along in the calm where I don't, I, and you know me, I would cause chaos and, and a lot of times bad chaos because I felt better in bad chaos, any kind of chaos than the calm you're talking about. Well, you're used to, you're used to pushing yourself, you're used to people pushing you really hard. So like, if you're an NFL player every week, it's a day, it's a box of chocolates. Like you don't know what you're going to get. It could be Monday morning, Sunday night, the best night of your life. Uh, you know, Monday, great day. People you're reading your press clippings. People are patting you on the back. You're go, you, it's a good vibe in the, in the facility or you I see a Wednesday even better, or it's, I don't want to go to the grocery store. Like there's no food in my fridge. Cause I don't want to leave the house except for to go to the facility because I am so embarrassed by the way our defense played mm-hmm. or I missed a tackle or I, I can't stop beating myself up over this thing. And it continues into retirement, by the way, which is something that like, I, I still haven't figured that part out, but I will tell you, I'm getting a lot better at riding the even keeled wave. And sure. I think, I think that's, if I could give you any deserve advice, it. Yeah, well, give the advice. Well, go ahead. Got, like we, so we you deserve give every, any advice. What were you gonna yeah. Say? Everybody deserves it. But my advice to a younger guy, when you get out is like, you got to get used to that still waters thing, man. You know, you, you just, it might be the scariest thing in the world to you. Some guys I play with are like, they can't wait to sit on the porch, right? you know? And I love time to myself and I love doing nothing, but I'm talking about not knowing what's ahead of you a week from now. Just, Hey, no structure for a little bit. Take some time, work on yourself. Do not lose, do not lose the hunger to get in the gym do not lose the the you know your don't let your health kind of slip because i kind of did it i was dealing with pain and stuff and i couldn't do certain things uh physically like my neck was really bad for you i couldn't like turn my neck like the way my dad turns his neck that's the way i was turning my neck so you know i couldn't lift like so i was losing weight i wasn't healthy um you know i i wasn't i was staying up late you know, working till two, three in the morning. I treated my body like a temple for 22 years. You know, yeah, I would go out and drink and have fun. Like I'm not like some square, but, but I, I definitely, I invested in my health. And, um, I think when you get out, there's no roadmap, that same thing. That's terrifying in a sense of like, just, you don't have anything to do. The most terrifying part is you need some structure. And I'm not talking about like, you need a job immediately. What I am saying is like, if, your downtime needs to involve eating right, Gym. exercising, sleeping, right. social interaction, right. you know, be around your friends and then build the rest of your life out. Because if you start doing that, that's going to take, you're going to get consumed in whatever it is, whether you're going up to New York to be in finance or you're getting in the media or you're coaching, like you got to take care of yourself. Your body just went through a lot of trauma and, uh, Great advice. and, and I think your brain chemistry like, honestly, since we do talk about mental health, mental wealth, whatever you want to call it, like, we are chemically different than other people. Mm-hmm. Because we needed that dopamine kick for, for so long, we needed, we needed to push ourselves. If you think about how often I exercise as an NFL player, even in season where I didn't really consider it exercise, you know, I'm, I'm on my feet 10 hours a week, right. not counting the game, well, you know, and, I'm, I'm, and you're and you're in 60 car accidents a day, or when you used to be able to hit 
every day. You know, it's, it's like, you got to get rid of those car accidents, yeah. but you got to <laughs> find something that pushes you that, right. that, you know, like, and you got to do something physical. So like you got, Hey, professionally give your head some time to, you know, like, don't feel like you're under the gun, but physically, mentally, and emotionally, you should attack retirement the way you attack football. And that means like taking ownership in, in your body, your diet, you know, the sleep you're getting, it's taken me four or five years to find an equilibrium and I'm still tweaking, you know, I'm yeah. still like tweaking with little things in my, in my health or in my routine. And I got all these things I want to do. It's a constant evolution, but if you're not trying to evolve, you know, don't worry about the destination. You'll figure it out at some point. I haven't figured it out yet, but like, if you're not walking that way, you're going to get stuck and you're going to feel like, you know, what the fuck am I doing at this stage? I mean, I felt lost over the past couple of years at different times and I was prepared. Hmm. Hmm. What you tell me where you're saying you were lost. Was it mostly lost as far as, okay, I don't have a, I don't have that daily structure, even though you're saying you did, but you knew to put it in or were you lost because you were still running on the hamster wheel? Nonstop? Hamster wheel. Yeah. I think it was, I think it's hamster wheel and that takes up all your time and you can't work on yourself. You, you look up and you're like, all right, I'm busting my ass to build this company. And like, you can justify it in all these ways. Hey, it's going to be good for my family, all this shit. But like, if I'm not seeing my kids as much, like, why did I retire? Right, you know, right. or if, or if I'm even more stressed now, like my wife had talked to me a couple of times and been like, yo, you're more stressed now than you were when you played because of running a business. Hmm. And, you know, like you have to have people around you to, to take your temperature and, 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 you know, come at you a little bit and be honest with you. So you need to surround yourself with people that are going to tell you if you're kind of falling by the wayside. So I think just, you know, when I get focused on something, I kind of obsess over it and, right. I got a little too wrapped up in trying to build this company. I know anybody that's built a company, that's the way. If you probably talk to Pat McAfee or something, yep. he'd probably say, fuck, there was a minute there where, and that guy loves to work, but I'm sure he had to take his temperature at yep. some point. And maybe it's happening now because that guy's nonstop. But right. whoever you are, like, that'll get you. I think also, like, I'm just really hard on myself. So I've always, I think your career, whether you know it or not, it's like a death you kind of mourn it in five stages, you know, and I don't know if they're in order, you know, grief, anger, denial, or whatever the fuck it is. But I went through different stages with my career where there's like the bargaining. There's like, you try to, you try to rewrite chapters that you didn't like in your head. Like, what could I have done differently? What if I wasn't drafted here, bro? Like, what if I didn't have to deal with this at this different, well, it's never going to change. And the thing I realized is like for players that, are still dwelling on shit in the past is like nobody cares dude except you like right. when you see the stories me, you, big for you but not for everybody else for everybody else it's like you know when i see people i'm not like running through how their career went you right. know there's some people you're starstruck by you know and 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 i had a great career and i had a lot of fun and Damn we got right. to win but there's a lot and it's a perfect example because i got friends that would be like dude you got to win two super bowls you played 11 years you had 70 sacks you fucking did all this shit right. I didn't get to do any of that, but it's all relative. And I think that's why even like hall of famers can be hard on themselves. Like, you know, my dad, yeah, like no doubt. guys done everything, but yeah. we always talk about we have deep talks yeah. at the end of on a Monday with the same way where we're, we could have three sacks. We're focused on the, the thing we didn't do. So how do you teach yourself to have grace during this? Like, what are you doing to teach yourself to have grace? Cause that, that's you know, the biggest thing. Again, you get caught in the sham for real. Listen, I was the first, minute by minute breaking news guy in this country before yeah. there was this NFL insider role, you know, yeah. where, before, yeah. when that internet thing first came out, I had yeah. two phones and a Blackberry and a fucking beeper. I think back yeah. to like, <laughs> it didn't stop. Right. It ruined every relationship I ever had. Cause it didn't stop. Didn't stop. Didn't stop. Didn't stop. And then I had to make a, uh, same as you, like a concerted effort. And thank God Fox said, Hey, you're going to die. If you keep doing this, we just need you to be great on Sundays. You're okay. Like you don't have to worry about this much anymore. Be a, a personality on this show, kick ass on Sundays, be better than everybody else. But that was hard for me to shut it down. And now I, I still work on giving myself grace because I don't do it the same way I used to do it. How are you trying to give yourself grace? How are you learning? Where do you go to learn it? Well, it's a fucked up catch 22, which is like a prerequisite of being great for a lot of people or accomplishing something is being their toughest critic, their own toughest critic. Right. And, and listen, I wouldn't have done it any, any different. I would have, 
I'm glad I was the way I was because if I wasn't, I definitely would be working at like Mincers in Charlottesville or something, you know, enjoying my dad's money or whatever. Like, <laughs> like I had to have a little bit of a different, you know, I had, I had to have a different standard for myself because the standard was so high for me. Yep. And the very thing that can make you successful is the thing that can sink you in retirement because it's a different game, dude. There's no gun to your head. You know what the gun to, is to your head is like, be a great dad, be a good husband, be, be a friend, you know, like, fulfill things that are important to you like enjoy things like find hobbies like this is the chapter of your life if you're financially secure is like keep that ball rolling feed your family but find some balance dude and there's no balance when you're a football player so i think i think but how are you yeah. giving yourself grace like how because you're sidestepping the question like you're I'm still, still looking no, no, for right I, well right. i'm gonna tell you i'm still figuring it out but because i'm i'm the same way as a media member right. but i think i think that very thing, that realization that like, once you realize you're even smaller than you thought you were, it's like kind of like zooming out and you get the planet, you have the, right. the solar system, you have the galaxy, and then there's like, you're like a little speck. That's the way I think about things. Like when I'm really, when I'm, it's like, bro, this, it's so small, dude. I'm going to be, I'm going to be dead in 40, 50 years. Like it's just not it's not important. You're going to look up and you're going to spend your whole life being hard on yourself and you're going to waste it and nobody's going to care. And there's not going to be a second chance at it. So like you're the only person living in your reality between your ears and like no one else cares at night when you're ruminating over bullshit, nobody else is thinking about the play you didn't make right. or the year you had when you got hurt or like whatever, dude, no one cares except for you. So you are not only wasting your time, you're also killing yourself, dude. Yeah, you know, because it's, stress it's, kills yeah. you. Absolutely. And so, and so I just look, yeah. Yeah, I just look at things like I, I want to live a long time and I want to be here for my family. And I, 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 you know, I just, we just had a daughter seven months ago. And like all of a sudden you're like, okay, I got to take care of my health. I got to take care of myself, yeah. man. You know, like, like you, I'm 38 years old. Like stress is part of it. And, uh, and I think therapy, man, like we've talked about this, but, I just had, I just said enough was enough at some point in, in uh, retirement. And, and I just started, uh, I went and I never had a problem with talking to somebody, but the, the person that you trust, right? Like somebody that you can trust, like that you, you hit it off with and you can trust. And, and so for me, I've, I've been seeing the same therapist for maybe right. three years now. And, uh, they're coaches for anybody out there who's listening to this view a therapist as a coach, like you go to strength coach every single day. Totally. These are just start. These are our feeling coaches, you know. Like, is there a heart, mind, and soul coach? Don't because so many guys are like, ah, I don't want to go to therapist. I, what if they say something? Or, I don't trust someone. Or how am I going to find someone? That one gets me crazy. How am I going to find someone? There's a million ways to find, right? And you have yeah, betterhelp.com, you just, what, what, and um, yeah. there's a million things. But they're coaches. But I, I got, I got something for you too. All right, um, this is something I do because we've got to train our our souls. Yeah, and. What I started doing is, so now I, I don't know if you meditate. I meditate now in the morning. I'll basically put on a song, right? And for the first song, I just go over things I'm grateful for. And it could be things yesterday, my whole life, whatever. I've got it now down where Rosie and I write a gratitude list every morning. Ten things we're grateful for the day before. Or we do it at night. Ten things we're grateful for that day. So we go to sleep with some gratitude. And it's hard at first because we don't give ourselves that grace. So you got to teach yourself. And it could be something like, I'm grateful for a Sammy. I'm grateful for God. I'm grateful for the sun. I'm grateful for a fucking pair of shoes. Whatever it is that made you happy that day, you put it. But the next song, and this is the key. The next song, I meditate on things I'm proud of that I've done. So I try and counteract all those things you're talking about. Of Why didn't I do this right? Why didn't I do that right? Or you did this wrong. Or you missed this play. Or you missed this, Jay. Or you missed that. Or you missed that. So now it's a song of things I'm proud of. And I had to train myself how to be proud of myself. And man, Chris, it's made such a huge difference in that grace that I'm talking about. And I could try that, but I got to tell you, I'm not really proud of much. Well, that's what you have to, you, and you, but you need to be. Well, Walter no, Payton, no, but, man of the year, all the wells that you've built yeah, out there. You, okay, but that, that's, hey, what's, the sweat that's what's you required. Built. What this okay, the time you put in, the sacrifice you've made, the sweat. That's what I'm saying. You gotta learn how to be proud of yourself, or you don't have any equity to balance the fucking scale. The scale's always gonna be in the way that you said. 
You know what I'm you proud gotta of? Build it. You know what I'm proud of? Honestly, like the football thing's different because, you know, I come from a different background than most guys and most guys have trouble with this thing. I mean, imagine if you go home and what you just did isn't extraordinary at all, which I don't right. need. I don't need that, you know, right. like, but it's a, it's the framing, the context with, with which I went out and embarked on my life's journey is totally different than, than most people, you know, like whatever you do is going to be compared to something that quite frankly, right. everybody who's wagging the finger at you, like you didn't do that. They didn't do it either. Right. Right. They're right. Just sideline motherfuckers, <laughs> right. you know? And, um, so, so I don't need to be proud of, I am proud of myself. As no, a no, 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 no. Here, but here, you know, but I'll tell you what I'm proud right. of. I'll tell you what I'm proud of. Proud of being a great teammate. Proud of, proud of, proud of playing hurt. Proud of, you know, right. I, but I don't get proud of accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? Because but you need to, but, but here's the thing. This is what I'm saying. Proud of being about. a dad. Okay. So every day, but none of that, Chris, this is where I want you to dive in. Okay. So look, when I first did this gratitude list, I was out in Thailand on my little, you know, fucking mental health journey, my mom, body, spirit journey. And, and these monks are telling me to get the prize. The shark that. didn't eat you in one bite. <laughs> I was, I was in a fucking jungle, out in the water. I was training <laughs> in the jungle, man. It was, okay. it, was, it was the greatest thing ever. Um, and, um, but these monks are like, I was dealing with these Thai monks. They're like, Hey, we need you to write a hundred things you're grateful for. I'm like, hundred things I'm grateful for. What are you guys fucking kidding me? And I was the same way. And they had to teach me. And it, like I said, they're like, well, do you like mundane little things like i put that down so same thing with the pride thing right you're like i'm not proud of this chris you got to go back and look at some plays that did fucking energize you like i'm proud of this i wasn't supposed to win on that day and i did that so put that in the back right hey um but it could be days hey i'm proud of i got one of my kids to do this hey i'm proud of one day i had a conversation with my friend that did this hey i'm proud of this fucking set i did whatever it was hey i'm proud that I was able to have this long career where I could buy this thing that I like. So I'm saying you got to train yourself instead of saying, cause you're already poo pooing yourself. So instead of doing yeah, that, I'm not no, I'm not poo pooing myself some for something to draw pride, like self pride. Like there are things I'm proud of. Like I'm proud of yeah. being a great dad. I'm proud yeah. of being a great friend. Like my boys would tell you, I don't change. I'm the same fucking guy. I'm proud of my work ethic. I'm right. proud of what we build at green light. I'm hopefully proud of the boss. I am. But with football, there's just something about it. You it know, does, like it I doesn't am, have to be football. Just yeah, okay. When you're there doing you go. This thing in the morning, the, yeah, yeah. It's just things you're fucking proud of because we're so used to beating ourselves up. So yeah. if you start counterbalancing it and start telling those fucking bad roommates, you know, having the good roommates say, "Hey, fuck that. We're in this town now. We're fighting back here now. Ain't just you guys talking in this head now. It, yeah. it helps you out tremendously. It's work, but you're talking about." Hey, how do we find grace? This is a way everybody could find grace, but it, it's work. So here, here, attack it that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Go and go and ahead. like you know, I I just also say, I don't know, when it comes to like retirement, one of the biggest breakthroughs for me. We talked about this recently. Was like actually formally getting diagnosed with ADHD. Right. You know, like that was a big ah. Oh, and when we were talking right. about therapy earlier, I totally wish I had gone to see a sports psych while I played because, you know, like as good as yeah. I was, I would have been better if I had, you know, if, like I was talking to a teammate recently um, about it was Lane. Right. And, and, you know, I, I, I can remember, okay, Lane's one of my best buddies. So, yeah. and he's been real open with me about the mental health stuff before he <laughs> kind of came out with it. And we, we have like tough conversations and shit. And then, like this He's year, about when Lane I, Johnson, right tackle for Lane Eagles, Johnson, right? yeah, man of the year uh, nominee. And to me, right. all those guys are winners, whether they win or not. Yeah. Um, but I, I think one of the coolest things for me is like a friendship like that, where you know I was coming into Philly do inside the NFL this year, so every Monday night I'd ride up in an SUV, and sometimes I'd leave a little earlier to go sit at Lane's house, and we'd watch Monday Night Football or something, and just kick it like we were still teammates which is great in and of itself, but we yeah. sat on the back porch and, and one night, you know, I had just recently talked to my therapist about like formally making, you know, attacking the ADHD thing. And just to talk to somebody who I identify as like me that talked me through 
you know, Hey, this is what this I've heard about this drug. Like maybe you could try this. This is a practice you could like, you could engage in, you know, just to even, cause there's some people that you talk to, you're like, that person doesn't understand me. Right. You know, and I think that's the hardest thing, whether the person does or not, whether it's fair or not. Yeah. Lane, for instance, was somebody that like, I wish I hadn't in my locker room when I played for most of my career because it's not that we didn't have deep conversations in that fucked up D line room in St. Louis, <laughs> but we didn't know how to frame them. And you didn't how to be vulnerable back then. It's well, no, we knew how to be vulnerable, but we didn't know how to con- frame whatever we were feeling in context. There was nobody that had gone out seeking solutions or talking right. about mental health issues. Like, like formally, right. it was more like, Hey man, I'm, I'm hurting right now. I'm sad. I'm my life's right. fucked up. You know, I, I just, somebody died back home or like we were tight. Everybody would talk about whatever, bro. I've had deep conversations, but a guided deep conversation with somebody who saw it, solutions mm-hmm. And I think what, what the thing that Lane's doing that's so great is there are going to be more guys like that in the locker room. Yep. And he changed my life having that conversation. Now, the first medication I tried hasn't worked out. Right. But what it I, did... I told you about the one at the Super Bowl, Calvary. Yeah. And is, you know what? I got to be honest with you. I stopped the Adderall, bro. Good. And, and I feel great. And honestly, yep. I feel better than I felt when I started because when I identified what the problem was, it was illuminating to me all the things that I've dealt with for so many years that aren't like, you know, they're not debilitating in, in a sense of like, I can't do my job or do this job. But there are things that you're like, what the fuck is wrong with me? And now that you know what you deal with, you can read, you can strategize. Like there's all types of things that I wasn't doing that are very controllable that can improve my condition. Right. But had I not had conversations with Lane to encourage me to go down that path formally, then I can't attack the problem. Right. Yep. And so while we might be vulnerable, we might be like, yeah, man, I'm at the bar spilling my guts to my buddy or whatever year four after a game. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're not really working actively to solve the problems and you don't know what the problems are. And I, I think that's why therapy is important. You know, I, I think that's really important. And anybody who says like, Oh, I don't know who I can trust. Like yada, yada, yada. Like, bro. All right. You're going to watch 20 years go by and you're going to say there was a you in there that was waiting to, to be out and live and, and in peace or some improvement, you know, in your, the way you feel and you're going to, you're going to lose that time. Like that for me is what changed is watching my kids grow up. And I'm like, Hey, don't I want to be as good as I can be upstairs? Like, don't I want to come to the, don't I want to, don't I want to show up with the, with the right equipment on? Don't I want to like, and, and that to me was that window with my kids where you only get it once. I'm, I watched my kids grow up from like three to now Wayland seven. And it was, it fucked me up. I was like, bro, you better get your shit in order like sooner than later because getting it in order at 60 like I want to get it in order right now so I can be present and be my best self for these guys and and now guys and gals. And now, you know, again, I want you to offset it now with saying, Oh man, I missed this with Wayland. But now I want you to start every morning and go, I'm proud of this I did with Wayland. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what I'm saying. That we gotta start working on that that other tool that's out there. Uh, I just want to point something out, you know, you and I had this ADHD talk. Like I was the first adult, one of the first adults, not the first. Diagnosed with adult ADD on the East Coast of America, Princeton University. I got taken into their their program um, in 1989. So mm. I got I went through Ritalin, and then they put me on Neurontin to offset the valleys of Ritalin because um, the peaks and valleys are bad. But yeah, I built my brain chemistry over the years, and then I stopped that, and the Adderall came out, and then you know I, I started getting this the brand name instead of the 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 generic instead of the brand name. And then finally a doctor said to me, or somebody said to me, I said, why am I so fucking manic? What's going on? Well, you know, when you get generic, they're not the same. All of them are different. They're all going to act differently. I'm like, what do you mean? It's not just Adderall. It's it's just mixed differently. So I was like, holy fuck. So I'm putting this poison in my body. That's getting my mind. So I'm by manic beyond manic, like sky And I had, Look, I lived with Lane for five months. He wasn't out at that point, right? He saw me go through shit. He didn't say anything. 
But I at least I had your dad who said to me, "Hey, hey, hey, the sky's not falling today. What the fuck is going on? What what is yeah. happening with you?" Um, and that's why I love this. You know, the, the, the other drug, Kelbury, that's a non-stimulant. It's helped me the stimulant part and getting the the generic forms of things. So I just want you to be careful. Of that is, it it was a almost a life ender for me. I would say by taking some of those generics where I would just act in a way like this is not you. It's not even you. Fuck. What is going on with you? What is happening? Well, that's and then the I did irony. beat up yeah. on myself. For, I beat up you're on myself try- a lot for, how, for how I acted during that time. You're trying to yeah. you're trying to find out who the real you is, but in the yeah. process, like the scary part yeah. about just taking different drugs yeah. is like it can fuck you up. And I'm not saying like people shouldn't try it. Like, hey, I'm not a doctor, but what I am saying is I'm just saying get you know, yeah. But every if be but careful the generics. But what you're doing, what I'm talking about, and what you're talking about, yeah. I really do believe. There's a lot of people, and I'm not trying to slight some people. Here's what I am proud of, Jay, yep. is that I will fight to improve. I, I will that. fight. I will fight like hell to improve, whether it was on on the football field or in the media or at my job. But also, I think the most important place to fight for improvement is in your head. Mm-hmm. And like, if guys aren't willing to because of not wanting to be vulnerable or like they're afraid to talk to a therapist or like you are leaving money on the table. And I'm saying that. I'm not saying that like from business sense, like in your life, you are leaving money on the table if you're not looking to actively improve, but you got to get a little muddy. You got to get a little dirty. Like there's going to be some trial and error, you know, like it's like I'm quitting. So little thing, I was hammering these zins, like these nicotine, man, like, like way too much. Okay. You know, I dip my whole life basically. And uh, I was like, well, I got to stop that because I don't want to like... I want to die <laughs> like like i get kids now you know it's like hey you know why'd you right. why'd you get mouth cancer so i switched to zen and then next thing you know i'm like a nicotine addict so right now i'm like trying to cut down and you're, you're doing all this trial and error like hey is this is this going to improve how i feel day to day like it might be you know you might not be drinking enough water it might not you know like there, there's all these obvious things that maybe are right under your nose that like but you just got to be willing to to cut certain things out, add certain things and like, be honest with yourself. And like, like you said, I'm sure you take a journal or a diary, Mm -hmm. but I try like hell, even with my ADHD brain to keep a record of what I'm trying to do to improve my life and see if like it actually worked. And so I just think it's like, it's trial and error, man, whether it's drugs or health or diet or sleep or like, it's all, it's the biggest puzzle, man. It's the hardest thing. You got to really try to improve at it. I love that. Like always trying to improve it. I think a lot of people forget that. that's, that's always got to be the eye on the prize. And, yeah. and then again, give yourself grace. Hey, I might've only, you know, done a little today or Hey, I might like every time someone leaves unbreakable, I tell our crew compliment that person, whatever the fuck they did. Even if they think they had a shitty day, Hey, you fought through a shitty day. Yeah. Right? That's something to be proud of. There's um, real, real quick here. And then we have, you have time for two more questions. Yeah. Okay. So the two last questions, but real, real quick here also in the ADHD part. When, when I first got diagnosed again, they tell me I have a learning disability. You know, being in the Jersey Shore with a learning disability ain't fucking great, right? <laughs> so, um, but I flipped the script on it. I looked at it and said, no, I don't have a learning disability. I just don't learn the way y'all teach. Right. Right. So right. where then I had to look at it and take a step further. Where does my ADHD give me power? Where is it my superpower? And I, and I think the same for you also. And it's something, again, to be proud of is, yeah, I may not be able to sit there and listen to a fucking lecture for, for three minutes or three hours, but I can do six things at once. That allows us to multitask, allows us to have six different things we're going after, allowed you to do all these different things to become the Walter Payton Man of the Year. And so your ADHD ended up helping you and being your Yeah, in some ways, yeah. No, yeah. I agree. And that's why I view it instead of the shame of it. Yeah. Look at look at things from a positive standpoint. Like I I know I'm I know I'm I know I'm probably better as a podcaster for having it in some ways. Okay. Uh you know, but but it's about identifying the areas where it hurts you and trying to trying to make little improvements right. or strategize to cover those weaknesses up. I love that. All right, last two questions. Um I've never talked to you about this. I was obviously doing the game. Give me something about the 28-3 game that we don't know, that you saw out there that you've never said or just the rest of us don't know about. Yeah, that's funny because I've had to talk at length about it. Uh, 
What I'm talking about for people who don't know. Uh, I mean, Mark definitely. Football I was. Fans, I mean, I they're was down gonna... twenty-eight to three to the Falcons in the Super Bowl, and and his Patriots and Tom Brady come all the way back and win. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to retire for sure. I mean, like you know, like I think I might have told you that before, but I, mean, I said this. I was pretty open about that game. It's funny, like Dad, he'll tell you this all the time. It came down to Atlanta and New England for me in free agency, and he had said he had nudged me towards the Patriots, which. Yeah, it was true, but sorry, Dad. Like, I, I wasn't going to Atlanta. That uh, Dan Quinn wanted me to play. In I was three trying point. to nudge you to Dan Quinn. <laughs> yeah, well, I love Dan. I love Dan, dude. But he wanted me. I was like, I was like, I went down there to Flowery Branch, sat in traffic for a very long time, and then I was like, um, you know, I met with Dan, and uh, Dan was like, "Hey, we want you to be like our Michael Bennett," and I'm like, "Well, that's a compliment and everything, right. but." He played inside a lot. So, you know, I'm going to go up to New England and play outside backer. Well, guess what ended up happening? Well, you end up playing uh, inside. Free technique. Even right. more. Okay, at least Dan was going to have me in a fucking four eye. Right. But the whole thing was, you know, like at the half of that game, I just, that was one of the lowest points of my life because not only was it like we're about to lose a Super Bowl 28-3 like everybody, but there were a couple guys in that situation on every team that's a very unique deal where it's like this could be it for you. Maybe you spent eight years in St. Louis and one in 15, two and 14, all that shit. Like I was done, bro. I was like, there's no way I'm going to keep doing this bullshit in another, in another 30 minutes. Like when this game's over, I'm done. And just when you think about the way your life turns out, that's why you just got to have gratitude. You say gratitude and all uh, like there, there's two totally different realities that I live in. If, if, if Kyle Shanahan runs the ball, uh versus if if he doesn't uh if if dante you Hightower, been retired. i mean i'd be retired and miserable wow now, i don't know maybe i'd have figure out a way to overcome it but the challenges would be totally different i'd have never i'd have never had those two years in philly which for me like the first super bowl was like wow. a weight off my chest the second one was like i didn't cry after the first one the second one i cried like a baby it was like some happened where it was like it's okay now you know like you can go. And of course I was like, I want to do it one more year. <laughs> so you're about to make me cry, <laughs> you know, but it it was, it was like, I'll never forget wow. being on the field and you know, you gotta, you gotta break through a lot of, a lot of bullshit to be satisfied in the NFL. Right. Like evidenced by what I just told you, like new England was great, but it wasn't enough for me, obviously. But the release after that Philly Super Bowl, I don't know what it was, man, but, I never get that. I never get that that feeling. My life is so much different. You think I would have had a podcast? I would have wanted to shut the fuck up and disappear forever wow. after 28 to 3, if that's wow. possible. Um, so I just, it was such a big deal. The funny story was before the game, and we almost cursed it. Me and uh, 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 Alan Branch, if you remember him. Big yeah, defensive tackle. tackle. Yep. We went to, like, the place was a zoo. Like, all around the hotel, there was a CVS or a Walgreens, like, a block away in Houston, like day of the game in our Patriots sweatsuits. We went in there and we got like a bunch of bottles of Andre and slipped them in our bag. Cause we were like, we're going to do the thing that fucking Mahomes and them did this year with the baseball celebration. So we had a bunch of Andre in our bags. I just cannot imagine how stupid we would have felt had we lost that game. <laughs> After the a bunch game, of champagnes we, in there. <laughs> yeah. Just like clinking around on the, on the bus and the way home. We got back there after the game. Evidently, Andre doesn't fucking shoot out like like Corbell or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's waiting for us to pop this champagne, and it just looks like a like a, a bad volcano. Um, and and you know, just like that whole week was crazy. The stories behind the scenes. If you asked every guy on the roster, you'd hear so much cool shit. Like the whole team was sick the year we played the Patriots. Like we were staying in the Mall of America. It was zero degrees out. Yeah. Everybody's got IV bags. Sh- like Friday night. You know, like the team's sick. Um, there's just so much going on. I funny story, the the Philly year when we were doing the walkthrough in the stadium. You know, Saturday you go do the walkthrough in the stadium, do pictures, your family comes in. Well, in the walkthrough portion, we were running fake plays that we don't even have in the playbook because they were so nervous about Bill or the Patriots, like Spygate too. They have somebody up in the luxury box. So there's so many untold stories from Super Bowl weeks, man. Um, it's just such an experience. Fucking incredible. All right. You, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, I got time for one more. Okay. 
Last question. I ask every one of my guests this. Give me your unbreakable moment. Give me the moment that should have broken you anywhere in life. Could have, but didn't. And as a result, you came out of the other side stronger forever. Probably the end of my St. Louis deal. Um, you know, I had to climb a, a pretty big hill, not as a draft pick. I was a high draft pick, but just like from a standpoint of bad team, a lot of expectations. You know, if you looked at, if you Googled my name, my rookie year, it would have been like Chris Long bust, you know, and, and really through the first half of my second year because I couldn't get it going. Uh, but then the second half of my second year, just started rolling and then, you know, like had 40 over four years and I was one of the guys, but then, then got hurt, you know, and, and tried to play hurt, you know, played through a high ankle, shot it up all year, contract year, had 13, got paid. Things were going well, broke my, did something to my ankle, had surgery, decided to come back, looked awful, like awful, embarrassing. If I look back at it, I wish I never played them. Um, the very next year came back. I felt like everybody thought I was on the way out pretty much. And second game broke my leg. So two years in a row, I hard. And uh, I'll never forget getting cut by the the Rams. And like the last two years, like the team moves, you know, um, I can remember the last night at the dome. It was the weirdest thing in the world. You're like, I'm getting cut in a couple of weeks. I've been here eight years. We're never going to win. You know, I'm going to leave an embarrassment. I came in. You know, my first year I'm a bus, my eighth year, I'm, I'm always hurt, you know? And, uh, I thought my career was, was over at that point too. And, and funny, I talk about the Pats game and thinking I was done, but I owe a lot to bill to bill Belichick for giving me a shot because I did not want to go play for any old team in, in, uh, 2016. I wanted to win. You know, like, otherwise I wouldn't have kept playing. And um, a place to build good memories. Yeah, like, right. yeah, see Winning what that's memories. like. Yeah, right. and so I'll never forget, we just had our first son, Waylon, and I'm in the hospital. I'm kind of feeling sorry for myself, even though the baby's here. I'm just still just dwelling on all this shit. I go to Harris Teeter to grab a six-pack or whatever, and my phone rings, and uh, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I better pick it up. And I, like, go to the front of the aisle where the service is decent, and it's like gross bill belichick you know in his voice and i'm like whoa <laughs> whoa <laughs> and um i'll just never forget like just the call he took a guy who was like really downtrodden probably ready to quit and i was like i have no information on what it's going to be up there but i'm i'm ready to go you know and um had he not called and he said on the phone he was like hey man you're a hell of a player i don't know what we're gonna do with you like, I don't know where you're going to fit, but I'm going to find a fit. And that leap of faith on my end and the leap of faith on his end, which he takes them all the time. This isn't a big deal for him, but it was the biggest deal in the world for me. And if it weren't for that, I probably would have broke. So some of it's me pushing through. We had a, a, a picture in our D-line room. Mike Waffle was our D-line coach. He was the coach for the Giants. Old Marine. Fucking intense cat. But... We had the, uh, this great room, Aaron Donald, me, Robert Quinn, you know, like William Hayes, uh, Nick Fairley, uh, Kendall Langford, like all first rounders. But we never had success as a team. And we had this picture on the wall. And I think this is true in life and it's true in football. There's this diagram of these two guys with pickaxes and they're like diamond mining. I'm pretty sure you've seen this. And one of the guys is walking right to left back towards the entrance to the cave with his pickaxe over his shoulder. And he's dejected sweating on the other side of that wall to the right where he's walking away from. There's a huge diamond, like six inches through that wall. And there's another dude on the bottom and he's just hammering away. And it's just, it's a very simple thing, but so many people give up before they get to realize what they've been working for this whole time. And for me, that was a very clean incident that illustrates just that is like, I was this close to saying, Hey, fuck this. And who knows what I'm doing right now, but my life is a lot better for having just, just wake up one more day, you know, just, right. just put your shoes on one more day. Just keep fucking walking, dude. 
You know, it doesn't have to be a sprint, but just walk. And if you keep walking, eventually you get a break. And, and that was for me, Bill calling me in a hair teeter. <laughs> I love that, dude. That is great, dude. You're yeah. a lot of our lives are better because of you, man. Just, you know, I appreciate you're gonna you. You can start Likewise, tomorrow bro. doing the pride thing, right? You're going to start. Yeah, tomorrow. I'll do it. I'll Good. do it. Perfect. And yeah. we'll and yeah. we'll be, be battle buddies. We'll check in. People don't know. I don't even think you know this, um, but you know, we had, and I'm going to let you go here, but we had trained uh, Chris in, in the Rams and mixed martial arts in his second year, I think it was. And, um, I made one of the nastiest fucking fighters on the planet named Jay Haran. He's a live bad. with Chris. Chris, just so you know, I made him live with you to make you more of an asshole. And man, mm-hmm. did it work. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, this is the, the, is this the part of the podcast where Jay takes credit for people's success? No, no, no. I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm giving Jay Haran credit for making you a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, I think he made me a dickhead because I was so pissed off at the fact that I had to do all the team workouts <laughs> And this guy showed up doing these two hour, like murderous workouts. And Jay was cool as shit. But the first week it was five people. The second week it was three people. The third week it was just fucking me. And it was like, all right, am I going to stay here for the full month? Like <laughs> he killed me. Hey, but that's why you're still there winning two Super Bowls, man. Yeah, you got to keep walking, man. Jay, but Jay's my was, boy, dude. There was, there was actually a hidden insult. Well, not a hit, an overt insult there. Had nothing to do with taking credit. You missed the yeah. insult. Fuck. Yeah. I don't know what the insult was. <laughs> oh, about being a dickhead. Yeah. Uh, hey, dude, I love you. I appreciate you. I'm fucking proud of you, man. Yeah. And yeah, let's. Hey, and again, like this is the best thing. We got people like this too, where you and I could lean into each other throw your ideas at each other. I've been through it now for a long time, man. So you got questions, call my ass up and go, Hey man, have you tried this? Have you done that? We've done that. Yeah, for and sure. I'll, I'll bounce it off of you too. All right. You got it, brother. All Good right, to man. see you. I love you, buddy. Chris love Law. You, dude. Thanks yeah, for joining us, brother. You,